Hey, hey everyone, it's Naomi Wolf with Daily Clout and I'm so honored and thrilled to be uh, joined today by Baroness Claire Fox um, from the House of Lords. Welcome, Baroness Fox. Good to be with you. Uh, so, Baroness Fox is the director of the Academy of Ideas, um, which she established to create a public space where ideas can be contested without constraint, which is rare and precious these days. Uh, she convenes the annual Battle of Ideas Festival, um, initiated a debating matters competition for sixth formers. In 2019, she was elected as MEP for Northwest England's constituency for the European Parliament elections. Um, and she's a visiting professor, or she was in 2020, at the University of Buckingham. So she's a member also now of the House of Lords as of last year, and she's a commentator um, on arts, culture, media, and free speech issues uh, all over the United Kingdom and globally. So thank you so much for making time for us. Good to be with you, as I say. Thank you. So I've uh, reached out to you specifically for our Profiles in Courage series. And the reason I reached out is that um, I'm very, very worried about what's happening in Britain. And you're one of the very few voices who is critiquing this completely unprecedented, in my view, this is just my opinion, um, unprecedented and un-British crackdown on freedom of assembly, civil liberties, freedom of speech. Do you want to speak to um, your view of this time in Britain right now in relation to, to liberties? Yes, I think uh, it, the argument is put to us everywhere that what is unprecedented is the nature of this virus, coronavirus, and the pandemic that we face. And in the modern era, a globalised era, it is the case that it's a very frightening experience to feel as though some medical condition threatens everybody, everyone you love and so on and so forth. So in relation to the attacks on liberties, I think many people, particularly at the beginning, but along the way, many citizens in the UK were happy or at least reluctantly prepared mm. to set aside concerns over liberty because they felt, well, maybe this is a short-term quarantine. You know, I don't mean that everyone in the UK has read Camus' The Plague, but, you know, maybe it's a short-term thing. We have to kind of, it's, it would be foolish mm -hmm. to not go along with this. We will. But I think what has shocked me has not been that people have been prepared to accept the physical attacks on their liberties because people are generous and they believe in social solidarity and they want to do the best thing for society. But it's the fact that there's been a clamp down on discussing it. Mm. You know, you start to get nervous when legislation is brought in and you're told that if you query the legislation, that you're or actually in denial about the virus or that if you say could I raise some questions about how long this legislation will last mm -hmm. is it temporary can I have an assurance it will all be rolled back mm -hmm. so what I think has happened is that you've got two you want to untangle these two things it seems mm -hmm. to me I, I, I think that it is reasonable for rational lovers of liberty to say that they will temporarily, for the sake of something else, suspend that liberty, not just to be gung-ho about it and go, well, I don't care, right? I, I, get, I can get that. But when you start to demonise and delegitimise discussions about whether it's the right strategy, when those people who are critical or sceptical of lockdown strategies or the heavily restricted practice of, um, you know, uh, public assembly or... or, or, or the fact that you, it's against the law to leave your own house in this country now without a... It's illegal to leave your own house unless you can justify it within the law, very small set of restrictions. These kind of things are unprecedented. At the very least, they require scrutiny, debate, discussion, a discussion about the balance of risks that we face as society. So my nervousness is not even the actual actions, but the fact that they don't want you to talk about it. Right. So very powerfully put, and you're speaking from the House of Lords, so uh, you're literally sitting in those debates and you're watching the legislation 
unfold and you and you're you're experiencing firsthand uh, and witnessing that people not just in parliamentary positions but out in the world of ideas and just ordinary citizens are indeed being um, demonized from what it looks like over here and and called denialists or COVID denialists if they try to raise ordinary questions you would raise in a democracy. Um, is that a fair assessment of what's happening? I think that is, uh, I think that is a fair assessment, yes. So, uh, I need, sorry, no, well, uh, Baroness Fox, I need to tell people who don't live in Britain what's happening because I don't think they would believe it um, if we don't represent it and there's been very little uh, media about it um, crossing borders and I worry that Britain also is being insulated from uh, other countries, which you can do now with the internet, you just kind of dial down access, dial up access, and people are in their filter bubble of of seeing what's happening in other countries. People in America, where it's not illegal to leave their homes, might be astonished. I mean, I have loved ones and family and colleagues in Britain, and I'm very actively worried every single day because what's becoming obvious to me, watching from afar, is that rights and liberties that have been embedded in British history and law for centuries are being chipped away, chipped away, chipped away with, without any due process. And the, the extent of this is extraordinary because indeed people cannot leave their homes, uh, you know, except for narrow purposes. Assembly is being restricted and restricted. As I understand, it was six people, then fewer than six. Um, you're being discouraged from having chats you know, in passing with people, you... Yes, you're not allowed to have a chat in passing with people because it's called mingling. And um, you you can only meet in the law, so you can you are entitled legally now to go out for once a day... No. ...for, for, for exercise. Oh, my God. And you can go to the shops, but only for essential foods. For essential foods. But when you go for your ex exercise, you are only allowed to meet one other person. From another household so the right to assembly is not just in case anybody thinks that we're all trying to plan to organize big demonstration we're talking about meeting your mates outside in the park for a sit on a bench or a chat or a picnic that's been restricted under this lockdown now the thing that again and and, and sorry because you've described it really well i mean we've we've been heavily what we call over here tiered, which is different parts of the country at different times have had different levels of prescriptive um, legal restraint on what they can do. But the full lockdown is for everyone in the country, and that was brought in, I think, three weeks ago. It's beginning to merge in my head. And then the only people who are allowed to leave the house are people who are doing essential jobs, which arguably, as a legislator, I am, so which is why I'm out of the house. Um, and obviously lots of people have to go to work. I don't mean they have to go to they have to go to work to keep the lockdown going because, you know, all those people who are happily locked down, you know, they need the technical engineers to 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 keep the Internet running. They need to get their deliveries from Amazon or wherever. So in other words, lots of or millions of working class people have to carry on working and all the health workers have to carry on, of course. But, but most people have been told not to leave home. Not to. I mean, it's not that they've been told not to. It is. Against the law. And what now, that people are, they're not arrest, arresting people en masse, right. but nonetheless, it has the, nonetheless, it is against the yes. laws to be back. Yes. yes. And so what, what penalty do you have if you leave your house and take your child for a play date or, you know, mingle with three people in a park or, or you know, well, have a dinner party? What not happens? Be, it's, not, it's not being systematically policed. I mean, in some ways, that makes the arbitrary nature of it, um, you know, it feels unfair. You know, the police are understandably uh, not going to go around swooping on every mother and child meeting another mother and child. I mean, I think that's probably legal anyway, because that's one person in the children account. But you're right, you know, if there's three or four people from different households, then that is illegal. They could find you enormous fines they're not doing that by, by and large but it's the sense of intimidation right so i was to use an example i was getting a train to go on a necessary for my necessary work and um i was met at the police station by four police guards who stood across the entrance and said where are you going oh. and i said i'm going home <laughs> and they let me through but the point is i have never in the uk had to 
kind of answer for where I was going in that way. So that's what it's like. So what I'm trying to describe to you is, is that people are frightened about the virus, but there's a climate of completely, uh, people are discombobulated and completely atomized. And the point that you were making is, in usual times, these highly contentious matters, we would have meetings or debates or festivals or get people together or even just your mates going down the pub and you'd sit around and you'd talk about them, wouldn't you? Yes. Whereas what's happening at the moment is people haven't got the facility to do that. And okay, there's Zoom events and I, the Academy of Ideas and my colleagues, we run Zoom panels of discussions two or three a week to try and create some sense of community and to discuss controversial issues. But it's just not the same. Okay where you can't unravel things in the same way. And so what's happening is, is that people are becoming more preoccupied with the minutiae of what you are and are a lot allowed to do. They're becoming more preoccupied about their health, about their, they're very nervous about their loved one's health. And they're also terrified they're going to lose their jobs when all this is over because obviously the economy has been shut down. Shut, shut and down. guess what? Lots of people are going to lose their jobs. So they're nervous and worried about that. How will they pay their mortgage? Will they get evicted? Their children are not going to school because Talk all to that because schools that's are closed. Another extraordinary thing we're watching from overseas is exams are being cancelled. Um, you yeah. know, yeah. And, and basic educational milestones are being suspended. Please talk to me about kids not being in school in Britain. So one of the things which the government insisted was that they would not close schools. You know, they had closed schools earlier on, but it was so understood to be historically unprecedented to, to, to do that, that they really did make every effort not to do it. And then they closed schools. Now, when I say they've closed the schools, the schools are open, but they're only open for the children of essential workers. Yes, or particularly so, vulnerable so, children. But that's effectively the schools are closed. And yes. because the schools are closed, they've now suspended exams. Now, what we've got to a situation now is that, you know, people keep saying about the mental health of young people, the disorientation. But I think it's I think that you can over scaremonger about that bit. The main thing is they're not being educated. They're not being educated, exactly. Imagine centuries for for universal access to education for people, whether they were privileged or whether they were poor, it didn't matter. You are, as a right, told that you have to go to school till you're 16. And it's a and it's and, and it's not just a, a right, it's a it's a fantastic privilege. Yes. That's where you acquire and then we fought long and hard for that. We're shocked when we hear about developing countries where kids lose school at yeah. eleven. We're shocked to remember that in modern history people left school at thirteen, fourteen. Now people stay on till sixteen, eighteen, maybe beyond. Now you can't go to school. And the 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 thing is irreplaceable. Now again there's a pandemic, you can say extraordinary measures, but it's in some ways the fact that um, for young people, they have watched an adult population tell them effectively that their education is dispensable with because of a health, a public health emergency, but that public health emergency trumps education uh, trumps all else and that no other risk and no other harm counts and I think being abandoned like that you know what it's like when you're 14 13 mm. 14 15 mm. you're told by adults usually get out of the house and stop right. moping around right. stop right. feeling sorry for yourself right. do your homework right. concentrate on getting your exams right. this is your chance to get a good job when you've got your exams mm. you must as a young person take responsibility for your future study hard <laughs> And now we say, uh, you know, we told you all that. Cancel, 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 cancel. Stay in your room. Don't move. Do a bit of work online because, you know, we told you it was really bad for you to stare at the screen all the time. It is. It is. Carry on. Do it. Do it 24-7 now because nothing, no other choice. Right? Sports? No. Can't do that. No. Can't have any of that. No joint sports. You can go for an isolated run as long as you don't meet anyone, but come straight back. So, so you can imagine what this is doing. They're not create. They're they're. This is a generation that is not going to have basic social bonds or basic. They won't know how to be in a group. They won't know how to be in a classroom. They 
and, and absolutely they're being told by leaders, your future doesn't matter. We're just going to put it on pause and who knows when we'll pick it up again. This is what I'm hearing. Is that correct? So uh, me, It's absolutely correct. Uh, I need to pause for just a minute. Um, thank you. All right. Um, bear with me. Okay, picking up again. <clears throat> so you're describing children and young people being isolated inside and being given the message that their future doesn't matter. I'm hearing reports of depression among teenagers, of uh, mental health issues among adults. Can you speak, I mean, you know, this is all very shocking to anyone who works in human rights because the Geneva Conventions forbid this kind of treatment of prisoners. And people who know about Guantanamo and solitary confinement and torture know that isolating a population indoors and, and forbidding human contact is um, has lasting psychological effects on people and, and changes really actually changes the brain. Like that's why solitary confinement is such a human rights issue. I am hearing from loved ones and colleagues in Britain a decompensating in terms of mental health, which is understandable under these kinds of restrictions and, and kind of um, learned helplessness, denial of agency. Can you speak to the mental health of people in Britain right now? So I, I've got one reservation about the mental health discourse that's happening, which has almost become the only critique that you can give of lockdowns at the moment is to say that it's leading to an epidemic of mental health mm -hmm. or mental illness. Right. So I'm slightly nervous about catastrophizing the mental health question. But I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated and I've written a lot on mental health over the years because I think there's a danger of over expanding the term. I don't get me wrong. I mean, first of all, I think that anyone who's got any kind of fragile mental health condition, this will have exacerbated it incredibly. You know, we consider that people who won't leave the house and become frightened to leave the house are agoraphobic. We actually give it a term, right. whereas that's become state policy. Right. It, it, it's and, so much and, like. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we and we worry about people who are also over preoccupied with themselves you know we kind of either in a narcissistic sense but also we worry about people who are constantly worried that they're ill all the time and again we give those labels and they are people who are obsessively cleaning their hands or washing tables we have a label for that right these things have become policy so it's hard to distinguish but what i would say is that um there's there's a kind of rational way in which rational grown-up people or going nuts, and I mean it not in the mental health sense, and I know I'm being glib with the phrase, but are tearing their hair out yeah. because they can't do what would keep them sane and what makes us human is sociability. And you're absolutely right. It's not solitary confinement, but it can feel like that. And what's more is, um, we've talked about young people, but one of the most, the cruelest aspects of this is, this is being done to protect the vulnerable and the elderly. But the vulnerable and the elderly are actually the people who are really suffering. That was my um, next question. You know, confinement. Yeah. I mean, they're locked up and they can't, they can't, and they haven't got very many years left of their life relatively. Forget coronavirus, because they know that they, they want to spend their 80s with their grandchildren, with, with, with the, the time that they've got. So, and if they're in, um, uh, 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 care homes then you can't go and see them you know you can only see them through the window and people are being locked in their rooms I mean these things are heartbreaking and so what I would say when you ask me about the mental health issue is I think that largely probably most of us are resilient mm -hmm. and even though this is going to be a terrible grim thing to get out of when it actually ends and we will be discombobulated. And I've watched that happen to people, people losing their bearings. And uh, by the way, people developing all sorts of mad crackers, conspiracy theories, because they've got into the dark web and they've started to go down the kind of QAnon madness route. Mm. But it's because they're at home with nothing to do, nowhere to go. They're trying to make sense of it. So you can see where it leads. But I don't necessarily think it's a mental health crisis. However, mm. where there are people who already are vulnerable, Right. lonely, right. miserable. It's hard to keep grasp of reality when you can't see anyone yeah. to kind of get over these things, right? Of course. And I mean, we've done a lot of reporting on the the, the science of, of this virus. And 
a lot of the narratives um, that are being reproduced in American media as well as British media just aren't borne out when you read the peer-reviewed studies. So, for instance, children not going to school. Children are not at risk from this disease. <laughs> you know, they just aren't. Outdoor classes have no risk. There's virtually no chance of aerosol transmission of the virus if you're sitting on a park bench outside with a friend or meeting mates outside. There are ways to safely reopen pubs, even according to, and, and restaurants, even according to aerosol transmission. Um, so the, and, and some of your own scientists, like Sunetra Gupta, at the professor at Oxford University, who's part of the Great Barrington Declaration, have come forward and said, this is madness. You know, let young people circulate. This is a disease that really strikes older people. Let's support them in, you know, being as sheltered as they want to be and let young people who will not be harmed by this and, you know, people in reasonable health go go about their business so that everyone can, because viruses, you know, we've had them forever and they they we develop immunities. This is a, a becoming a more and more recognized and respected scientific point of view. However, these scientists in Britain have been targeted as maniacs and very, very marginal. Um, what's what's your view of whether Boris Johnson is presenting science for these uh, draconian edicts? I I don't see that when he issues a lockdown. He's and, and these draconian restrictions on assembly that he's actually providing peer-reviewed studies to support it. So the thing is, I, I, one thing I'd say is that the, the the science is disputed, and that's the point in in many ways. Um, when I say the science is disputed, first of all, there's no such thing as the science. Mm, right. But obviously, the government, and this is completely appropriate, I suppose, have, are surrounded by scientific experts on a committee called SAGE right. that give them advice. But ultimately, they are have to make political judgments. But everybody says, are you following the science? But of course, you've indicated that there are different ways of approaching this. Now, the Sinatra Gupta, who I admire as well, but the great Barrington um, uh, um, deal scientists have been basically we've been essentially told that they are quacks but that their quacks. sciences no i know i know but i'm what i'm trying to say is now yeah. there's arguments amongst scientists of course right. there are of course because there are. above anything else it's a new virus right right it's so unprecedented this virus in this way that means that you have to have lots of discussions nobody knows what is the right, right way to deal with it as you say sometimes they will say um, well, it doesn't affect children, and, and, and it doesn't affect children as far as any of the evidence goes. But then they said, well, maybe the children transmitting it to each other, it brings it back into the community. In which case, let's have open discussions about the right. pros and cons of whether the schools should be open or not. In other words, I'm not trying to claim my scientists are any better than your scientists or any better than that scientist. I think that there should be an atmosphere of intellectual freedom mm -hmm. so that society in a grown-up way can say, so we know that if the schools open, potentially there mm -hmm. might be slightly more community transmission mm -hmm. because kids from different schools, uh, they might not be getting ill, but maybe they're putting it on. Um, but is that uh, worth it? Right. Because otherwise we're denying a generation of children right. education, which is a big thing to do. Big. And so you can have these. But what's not happening is we're being infantilized right. intellectually right. by being told that these are the good scientists, right. the advisor government, and they've got the answers over right. here. And anyone who is remotely skeptical is a bad quack scientist who isn't really a scientist, who's a shill, who's working for someone else. It's all to do with big pharma. It's all to do with this. It's all to do, you know, and then they say big pharma. And then you think, well, I thought you were keen on the vaccine and that's created by pharmaceutical. Mm -hmm. So, you know, is there good pharma and bad pharma and which become so what drives me mad is the simplification of the message right. that then treats us like we're idiots who can't understand complexity mm. and doesn't give anyone any options as to, well, maybe we should decide that we are prepared to open this bit up mm. and take that risk mm. and not open that up and not take that risk. Then that's a grown up decision. It's not what's happening here. Well, you're, you're striking at the very heart. Baroness Fox, of what is so troubling to me as someone who loves Britain and British history and culture. 
the way this is unfolding seems very un-British to me. And what I mean is um, your country, uh, you know, was at the forefront of freedoms of speech, privacy, autonomy, and open inquiry, like post-enlightenment, free inquiry, robust debate. And even the history of your journalism in the past and, and parliamentary debate has been robust and open. And I'm very, very worried at this very un-British approach to knowledge, right? That, that you know, here's, as you said, here's good scientists and bad scientists. Here's, here's good points of view and bad points of view. And I agree that this is a, a, a very un-British infantilization of a population that has a robust tradition of free speech, open debate, open inquiry, intellectual rigor. Um, and what you're describing, I've heard you also describe debate in Parliament, that you can't have a, a kind of robust back and forth anymore. Is that due to the actual structure of debate now that there's kind of virus conditions in the House of Lords and the House of Commons? Can you speak to that? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the most, it, it looks like just a technical issue, but it's really annoying that in order to comply to COVID safety rules and also because there is hybrid uh, conditions so lots of people are, uh, lots of parliamentarians are zooming in right. so because then they can't interrupt they've had to staccato it so we're all doing lists you know I'm number seven on the list you know so you're not sort of putting your hand up or anything there's no interaction which means that people do pre-prepared speeches because the lists have to have a certain length of them I, I was you know I put myself down on the list to speak this morning and didn't get taken because somebody else somewhere else is doing the list whereas in normal parliamentary proceedings i'd stand up and try and get taken and it would be much more transparent so that's happening but i think there's also a different so there's a technical way that it's just not mm -hmm. parliamentary scrutiny is just not occurring but there's also a, a a sort of different way which is if you delegitimize any skepticism in relation to lockdowns not covid but but right. You delegitimize it by calling people COVID deniers mm. or deniers, which immediately puts you into the camp of Holocaust mm. denial, of course, right. so is a terrible, you know, yeah, but that's the word, the way the word denier is used, isn't it? And if you feel as that, and you're told that you are anything you say that's skeptical of government policy is uh, putting, you know, grandparents at yeah. risk, the elderly at risk, that you're, that you are actually putting forward misinformation it's the equivalent of, of 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 conspiracy theory misinforming people and so on. People lose their confidence. Yeah. Parliamentarians lose their confidence. They don't want to be seen like that. Right. So I I found that it it's quite. I mean I, I I stood up in the the last time I was involved in any kind of debate is overstating it, but discussion on COVID regulations. I was one of the very few in the House of Lords. I mean there was more in the House of Commons, but there wasn't very many. And I felt the chill wind of, of, you know, the kind of pressure where you think, oh, should I do this? You know, yes. <laughs> I don't know. If I, but do I want to be the one uh, right. that say this? And the irony was, was that my speech in that, in that debate was in defense of skepticism. Mm. See, it wasn't a defense. It wasn't actually an attack necessarily on lockdown. It wasn't necessarily a detailed discussion on the variants of COVID and whether they were more transmissible or not. Mm -hmm. It was saying it's important that we have a sceptical approach. When, and, and one of the things that you have to, you know, you feel as though you're right about what's happening in Britain is you feel as though you're slightly eccentric or you have to apologise when you argue for the importance of liberty. Now, at the very least, it's, it should be the other way around. We are free. It's right. up to the government to justify to us why they take away our liberties. It's so it's gone so far now that if you say the word "what about our liberties," people go, "Oh, for God's sake, you and your libertarian principles!" As though somehow, and I'm not even a libertarian, it's as though somehow saying freedom and liberty and free speech are important, or or has been so marginalised. So it's sort of, "Oh, Claire, they talk to me like, oh, Claire, we know that liberties do your thing." What do you mean, my thing? This is a free society. It's not as though I'm raising these issues as some kind of badge because I think I want to just say the word freedom while you say health. I mean, the reason I'm rather glad that I don't live in a totalitarian country, the reason I'm a Democrat, the reason I'm a modern post-enlightenment person is because I think freedom, you know, is 
important. I hardly need say that the reason why we don't like slavery is because people are owned and treated as chattels and aren't free. The reason we like freedom and not totalitarian regimes like China is because you're free. I feel as though I have to apologise or explain to people why freedom might be a foundational principle, not some marginal little thing you throw out. So this is my last question, and you've exactly brought it forward. First of all, let me ask, who's saying that to you? Like when people say, oh, Claire, you and your liberty, who is it? Is it the press? Is it other parliamentarians? Is it Boris Johnson? Who's who's giving that message? Well, pr- practically everyone, to, but but they don't say it. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously caricaturing, but it is that it is given a second order um, treatment yeah. in preference to safety. By, so what's happening is by, the shift by, 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 no, but, no, but by everyone. That is the now the acceptable narrative. So there's always been a tension between safety and freedom. Mm-hmm. It comes up in relation to fighting terrorism. It comes up in relation to everything. Right. And if you want that, that, that it's always a sort of, you know, would you rather be safe or free? You know, uh, and the chipping away of liberties over the years is usually in the say in in the face of people being fearful about something, and it's something you have to negotiate. I understand that. Um, the balance is now swung completely to safety, safety. trumps all else, liberty, and safetyism versus liberty. Now we've seen that that didn't just emerge during COVID. One of the things that I I wanted to say is that. These trends have existed pre this pandemic and what's happened is they've consolidated. So we've seen a a, a gradual move towards risk aversion in society. Mm -hmm. We've seen a gradual move towards putting safety um, above liberty over the period of time. We've had safe spaces in universities, Mm -hmm. an extraordinary situation where young uh, aspirational students who you'd expect to be wanting to go out on life's rich adventures, call for safety and comfort, and call to be protected from dangerous ideas, et cetera, et cetera. So you've got that already in the background. And public health has been more and more nannying and interventionist over recent years. COVID has brought all this to the fore. The balance has now swung so much that if you say we're doing this to keep you safe in a paternalistic way by a government, mm-hmm. that will buy you shutting up the people who go on about liberties and it's just that liberty is therefore treated not as foundational but as a luxury that mm-hmm. we can't afford to have in this period I, and that is very dangerous relativism of liberty dangerous. and it wasn't even a, a, a received discourse in the second world war or the first world war i mean there were fights about restrictions of liberties as as i recall from from history, uh, ri- ri- you know, rigorous fights. And so this brings me then to my kind of last set of questions. All right, well, are you not hearing from your constituents that they want to be let to make their own decisions and and, and that they don't want their homes and businesses to go under? Aren't you hearing from publicans and restaurateurs and parents of children saying, Claire, keep going because, you know, this cannot go on? So the big shocking thing about the UK is is that we have a House of Lords, which I'm in, that's unelected. It's an unelected chamber. It's appointed. So I'm got any constituents. Oh, I beg your so, pardon. Uh, no, it's all right. Don't don't apologise. It's actually you? it's one of the anti-democratic aspects of the legislation in the UK, and I don't approve of it, even though I'm in it. Um, I'm using it as a platform, but I think that's wrong. Anyway, that's that's an amusing aside, um, although probably serious in a different context. I when you say are we hearing. I, all of the opinion polls would indicate that the majority of people support the lockdowns and support the government. Mm. And I am not in a position to query that. I mean, I can't, I can't, I couldn't say that's a lie. Some people say that's not true. And I think, well, how do you know? Because one of the things about lockdown is we don't really have a public square. There is no public yeah. opinion. People are atomized and isolated. And of course, when you're atomized and isolated, um you know the fear eats in on you and 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 you you haven't what it also means is that there's no political arena in which you can persuade people because there's no place that you can gather and you know i i think if you gave me 100 people uh, in a room and we were having an argument that maybe if 70 of them were worried you might be able to win over 10 of them to be less worried and put liberty but there's no public square is there 
The yeah. only square public square we've got is Twitter and Facebook and these. Um, we all know the limitations of arguments on those, let alone the kind of censorship that's emerged. So that's one of the problems is there is no politics. There is no public debate. There is no discussion feasible. But when you're saying, oh, they're worried, I think that uh, there's also a, a, a minority, a substantial minority of people who absolutely hate this. Mm-hmm. And then a, an additional group of people who want it to be over and will do anything to end it. So they'll go along with any right. restriction. And one of the things that's happened in the UK, which is not quite yet happened in the US, is that there's been a fantastically successful rollout of the vaccines, mm-hmm. of two different vaccines um, on the elderly. And people really genuinely believed, look, let's have the lockdown, roll out the vaccine. Mm-hmm protect the, the roll out the vaccine to the most vulnerable the top four tiers as they're called the the the, the, the elderly and the vulnerable and once that's done we'll be free so yeah. in a way they kind of go claire shut up stop being skeptical gotcha. let's just get through this right. now what's happened is the vaccine rollout is going really well we're in this lockdown and then you hear politicians say well maybe we need to vaccinate the over 50s first or maybe there's a particular variant that means that we can't relax the lockdown yet. I see. And so people starting to say, I only agree to this because right. you promised me. Right, right. So I haven't, I wouldn't say you've got a rebellious mood, mm-hmm. but what we've got is a disillusioned, cynical mood. I keep your head down, get it over with. I want to go back to normal. I'm quite hopeful. People think that maybe the young will be the ones. The thing that I love about the... Um, uh, el- elderly uh, recipients of the uh, lockdown. When I say elderly, it, re- it suggests frail. We've had this discourse about the older uh, generation as p- potentially vulnerable to COVID. So you think them of vulnerable need protection. My God, I don't know if you've met any over 18 year olds here, but quite a lot of them are quite feisty, right? So what are they doing? They're all going, can't wait to go on my holidays, get the caravan out. I'm going to see my grandchildren. I am, once they've had their vaccines, They've got plans, man. Right. They've got plans. And so I think that, ironically, this group that we've sort of robbed of agency and said we're doing all this on your behalf right. might even be the ones who'll just go, OK, we've had the vaccines, we've right. put up with this for months, right. I'm going out now. Right. I mean, from your mouth to God's ears, as my grandmother would say, well, let's ask, first, I, I need to give you information. YouGov is not an independent agency. It's privately funded and i think people in britain don't I know but they do they, a lot of people know that but i just don't know there's not it's not just you go polls to be frank no. i mean I I, I I look i just think polling is unreliable mm-hmm. at the best of times absolutely people don't always tell you what they think it's just that i can't say i've got quite a good you know uh, instinct about I, I, a lot of people agree with these things i mean people are i think you can't underestimate homes being bombarded with propaganda they can't meet their mates they can't even i mean i'm saying is i don't think it's the problem is the polls i think it's that problem i think people genuinely are like no what else can we do now what i'm saying is you can see shifts every now and then and i've noticed a slight shift which is people becoming suspicious of politicians having promised us that if we did behave Right. Did everything right. The rules. That we could get out of it all. And then when they start to change the goalposts, I've seen more people saying, you're just changing the goalposts now, right? Yes. Understood. All right. So lastly, well, I just want to say as a journalist, um, it's been shocking to me how untransparent some of your key British uh, documents are about this for example the coronavirus dashboards which everyone is referencing as driving the tears i run a digital dashboard based on government data exactly like those i build them i know what goes into them if you can't see the raw data sets you can tell any story with those dashboards and the raw data sets you have to submit a freedom of information request to see i don't even know if as a non-british citizen i have standing to do so so that's very very concerning that's a real red flag and there are other problems with the dashboards like the pcr tests which you may or may not know the tests on which they're based have been discredited by the world health organization which again 
your media is not covering. So um, this whole lockdown is being driven by data that is not transparent, that that can be misused, and and that you know key aspects of it are falling apart. I just wanted to let you know that because um, to me as a journalist, that's incredibly concerning. I think that's the thing is I think that I, I do think I mean I, I'm not sure that I entirely agree on the PCR test being totally discredited, but um, in a way. The point about these things is that doesn't mean that they shouldn't be debated and covered like in the way you say in the media. But on the data question, I think one of the most frustrating things is when you do get data wars. I mean, you just feel all the time that, you you know, you know, you, you sort of see one set of data and then somebody shows you another set of data. And it, 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 it's mind boggling because you can't break it down. And, and, and a lot of the thing that you're saying is a lot of the data requires more granularity in order to understand it because I want to say understand it is to draw any conclusions because you're not quite sure what it means. You can see the data, but what does it mean? I mean, why are there more hospitalizations now? What's driving that? Is it just or or or, or why are the hospitals overwhelmed as it is? What you why is the NHS not coming? Is it because of COVID patients? Is it because more staff are on uh, uh, off sick because they're under so much stress all of these different things um i'm not making any claims i'm just saying it's only through understanding that what i think the difficulty is is that it is literally become data wars mm. you know and and, and and people going lies lies and you know that's wrong that's wrong and certainly data has been used to scare people, but also data can be manipulated. So it does become statistics, damn statistics, doesn't it? I want to know the truth of it, but it's not just the whole truth either. Right. Because even I mean, behind it, you have to yeah. have more of a, a narrative. I do hear you, and that's true of the interpretation of data. But what I'm saying, and I'm speaking to someone, again, who builds these dashboards, is for any dashboard to make sense, and that's those COVID right. That, that are the basis of Boris Johnson saying tier one, tier three, you stay in, you can come out. Um, you you can tell any story with them if you, unless you see their CSVs of of the oh, raw right. data, right? And right. and when you ask this, like that is not in question. That's fact, right? And and sources, methodologies, raw data sets. Without knowing those, you can do things like set the API so that it upticks every month instead of daily or there's a lag over Christmas and then it'll show up as a spike, right? But it's not a spike. So without being able to, to show people like me or other data scientists um, the raw data sets, you really can, as I said, and as you're saying, tell any story with the statistics and how they're framed. And I think that that's what you're saying. But to me, I'm saying something even more basic, which is reporters are not being allowed to see the raw data sets. Right, right. right. The CSVs right, that right. say, yeah. you know, name yeah. every case, personal identifying details, you know, blocked out, yeah. um, and to prove that these really exist, right, without yeah, yeah. a FOIA. So to, to me, again, as a journalist, that's a real red flag, you know, and, yeah. and we're seeing this in dashboards elsewhere as well. But leaving that aside, last question, is this lawful? Right. You have rights as British citizens. You have freedoms to assemble. You have freedoms of speech. You have rights under the Charter of Rights. I wonder if Brexit means that you're not covered by European human rights law anymore. But, you know, does Boris Johnson, does this administration have the right to have these emergency powers? How long do the emergency powers last under law? And what is the legal process for rolling back the emergency powers? Say that people get sick of it, right? Say they want to lobby you to change the law. Does that process even exist anymore? What's the way out of it, let, you know, in terms of British law? Um, slightly differently in the UK. I mean, first of all, I, I don't think the courts are going to solve this for us, even if, even if we were part of the uh, European Human Rights uh, Law which I'm not a great fan of anyway. But um, the, the, the point about the, these changes is they are legal. Mm -hmm. And in fact, they've been passed in Parliament. Now, I there's questions. Yeah, yeah. So the, well, the point is a lot of them were passed um, retrospectively. So brought in as emergency legislation. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, I mean, just to use one example of what happens. Uh, the, the last time the legislation was renewed, the coronavirus legislation, it was renewed. There was a bit of an argument. Hardly anyone voted against the government on this because, as I say, broadly speaking, most people go along with it. Um, 
But even within that, they they kind of hid certain changes that they made. So, for example, it only was revealed by a new by journalists that they'd found a clause in it which had basically given local councils the ability to carry on lockdown measures until July. Now, that July date had never been mentioned in the public discussion or even in Parliament when it was passed, but it was there if you'd have read the small print. But, but it's I not as though... No, read the bill before you pass? Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. These are hundreds of... No, but what I'm saying is if somebody doesn't draw your attention to the right. amendments in the bill or the changes, so it's technically fine. Right. It's just that... You know, nobody's around. There's not even the kind of have you check section section, you know, and you've literally got this is an emergency thing. We've got a four hour debate. You got issued the papers yesterday. You have to vote it tomorrow. So there's no the usual scrutiny of how these things happen doesn't isn't happening. So all sorts of things. Now, you know, they're just being not accountable, but it's not illegal or we don't have the same constitutional question as, as, as in America. But when you say what can be done about it, I think that th- the most important thing is that these things are raised by people, not just like me, but raised by any of us. And, you know, those journalists who prepare to and um, and anyone with a platform and, you know, you've got your pod, you know, people, these kind of conversations need to happen more and more and be amplified as much as possible. Not because you and I would agree on everything, but because it's a conversation in which people can sort of get the nuance of it and think about it. And the more and more these things happen, these conversations, and the more we can get the word out, the more and more that the public side of scrutiny will um, frighten the government. That's all I'm saying is ultimately their authority, their legitimacy comes from the public. Right. And at the moment, they believe that the public are compliant enough, frightened enough to go along with this. And that it's not as though the government are being mean. I mean, they are themselves reactive, I think far too risk averse, reactive, terrorise, are going to get blamed for deaths. And so they're kind of only seeing things through COVID eyes, not handling it very well. But they're not malicious. They're not sitting there going, yes, we're taking your freedoms away. It's mm. just that we, we all know that once the state gets used to having more power at the expense yeah. of the public, it's hard to get them back. But they're not doing it for that reason. It's not some conspiracy. When they feel that the public suddenly are looking askance mm-hmm. and are going, what? You mm. took that freedom away. Well, mm. you know, I'm not voting for you if you don't. Right. That's what we need to get back to. And I think that in the next... I mean, it's going to take some time, but that is what is important for us to aim at, not not to kind of just, I mean, there have been attempts to go to the law courts around different aspects of what is, and they've just been kicked out because mm-hmm. actually that's not the way, they haven't done it that way. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. All right. Well, Claire Fox, you, you're you such a, a voice of um, reason and uh, you are showing so much courage, I'm sure, in an environment like this to um, speak out in defense of basic freedoms in Britain and people's right to speak and discuss. So if people want to support you, what's uh, how can they help you? Where, what should yeah, they do? so, uh, well, I mean, do check out the uh, Academy of Ideas. So it's academyofideas.org.uk. Um, I think there might be a US one. So it's the org.uk counts, um, Academy of Ideas. Um, and we have regular discussions. Well, now, the, but the only good thing this pandemic has done is that in our Zoom debates, we actually have quite a lot of people from all around the world coming to the discussions. So, we, you know, anyone from can join in. And I think, you know, we're, and, and there is varied as anything from the next one is will classical music survive uh, uh, through to a discussion on Corona generation and some of the points that you were making about the impact on young people, which is uh, a book launch for a mother and daughter who uh, a teenage daughter who've written a book called Corona Generation on what's going on. And I just think that, um, you know, so to support the Academy of Ideas, check, you know, usual thing on Twitter, Facebook, blah, blah, blah. Um, but Naomi, it's been a pleasure. And I think that, you know, one of the things that is important is that um, those of us who have any influence at all keep these channels of discussion going and encourage people to just think for themselves and I've had too many friends who've gone down kind of conspiratorial uh, rabbit holes on the one hand or have become so fearful that I'm frightened they'll never be able to kind of go out and have a full life again and I just think it's uh, we have an obligation to each other as citizens to say let's 
hold our nerve and it's scary and it's horrible, but we will get over this and then we've got to start rebuilding as we want a society to back. And when I say rebuilding, I'm not saying build back better. I'm saying my rebuilding will be a free society and back to normality. Wonderful. Well put. Darrenis Fox, um, Academy of Ideas, thank you so much for your time. Uh, Profile and Courage. Thank you. Bye-bye.